Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Hello, Internet. I must tell you, I'm excited, man. I'm speaking to the academic people these days, and we have another lecturer here, and he's very welcome. He's Andrew Swanepoel, and he's doing something for a PhD, and he needs your help, and he can explain himself. But before we start with that, Andrew, welcome here. Thank you for contacting us. If we can be of any assistance to the academics, we will we will gladly do that. I said to him before, I'm very impressed with his hair. You know, we've been looking like this since I was about 22 years old. And uh, uh, you did serve. I mean, you did do your national service, actually. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I went, I was the 82, 1982 intake, uh, July. Um from Durban, and you can imagine going to Kimberley in that freezing weather, big shock for me. So I was uh, one of the first, I think I was the second intake for the SA Intelligence School in Kimberley. Um, initially, it was 11 Commander, which was the Donny Tyrone Craig School. So when we got there, the Craig School was still there. Um, but yeah, I was the second intake with the new SA Intelligence School Um and uh, we were trained, did our basics, and then they started getting rid of some of the troops, and then we did our bush phase, got rid of more of the troops, and then they had the guys who were specializing in SA intelligence, so like com ops, uh, interrogation. Um, and I think, as you know, the guys in the army will know we were called sniffle tiffy, so we were scouts. Our basic rank was for Kenner or scout, and that relates to Donny Tehran, who was the founder of the, the Boer Scouts um, Corps. Um, yeah, so we our specialized in ComOps, which was civic action, so the hearts and minds campaigns. And then from there, we were sent out to, to deploy to different bases. Um, as I said, yeah, we were like new. We were the, only the second intake of these SA intelligence uh, soldiers. Um, I went up to, so we traveled by a train from Kimberley to Vintok. Um, there we stayed in a Dierkans base called, I think it was Tiger base, something like that. Um, and then from there, we waited for transport, went through to Grootfontein, and on the way they dropped off the, 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 rest, the rest of the soldiers to the different bases. From Grootfontein, we waited for, I mean, yeah, from Grootfontein, some of us went through to Rundu, waited there for a, a while for transport. And then the guys that were left went along the Caprivi strip and some guys were dropped off at Buffalo. And then I went through to Amiga, which was a 201 battalion, which was the Bushman unit. Um, there were three of us, two of them went to the Bush Bushman school, the primary school that was there. Um, and I was involved with, uh, at the time, Commandant Adams was there. He was really new then, and he had just started. And his wife was there, and they were really involved with this, this idea of hearts and minds. Uh, we had the Bushmen on our side. We wanted to keep them there. Uh, they were incredible soldiers. They had their families with us. Um, I don't know if you know that they were refugees from uh, the Angolan War. Um, and yeah, um, we were uh, fortunate enough for them to start fighting for us. Um, and the idea was to keep them there like that, you know? Um, and that was my job. So I was involved with the training of the Bushman soldiers when they came out, basic skills like understanding Afrikaans so that they could take orders and understand what to do. Um, but I was also involved with uh, Mrs. Adams. So Commandant's wife, she was very involved with the Adult Education Centre. Um, and I was the first guy involved with that. Um, um, yeah, and I spent my, my, my years there. Uh, I think it was 14 months. I was up there and then yeah, I got I went out. Um and then yeah, as as I started studying, I'm a visual artist. So as I started started uh, studying um doing my post grades, I found myself um expressing the stuff that I'd experienced in the army through my art. Um if you if you're interested in finding out about that, I can I'm quite willing to share my website. Um and then there's Jan van der Marba. I don't know if you know Jan van der Marba. He's a South African artist that does similar things. So check him out if you're interested in these artists that deal with their experiences in the SADF by creating. And that's it, yeah. Thanks, Chris. No, I have to wonder, yeah. 
But before I tell you what I'm wondering about, mm. just an interesting thing was Darling Troll was the first guy we used the pseudo name, which we know about, of James Bond. Isn't that interesting? People don't know about it. Really? Yeah, wow. really. No, no, I, 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 I read it somewhere. No, he's a really interesting guy. Yeah. No, he was fantastically good. I mean, he was a good operator. But how did yeah. you get a security clearance? You being a Swanapool who sort of speak uh, the Queen's English, yeah, yeah, must... you speak an army. Uh, I mean, how is that possible? I know. I don't know how it happened. They just, they, they, we did a lot of psychological testing. Though. I must admit, they, they had like these uh, doctors come down and test us with, you know, you do the Rorschach tests and everything. So they were very strict with, uh, with who they took and kept at the base. But they obviously saw that I would be quite good at the hearts and mind stuff, and that, that's the direction they put me in. But yeah, yeah, we went through a lot of strict testing. Um, is an artist born or is an artist made? I think it's a combination. I think I think you need to want to be able to say something, and you need to then visually be able to do it. So it's that choice. Yeah, you need to have something that you're passionate about that you can't use words to explain. Um, yeah, so and then the rest is about training yourself, technical skills. You know, it's all about that. You've got the skills and you can express yourself. So, how would you feel about this artificial intelligence things start creating art? Would that be art in your brain, or is it just the technical expertise with different colors of paint and things? Well, I'm busy at the moment. At, uh, I lecture at a university that deals with design schools, with de uh, with design studies, like uh, graphic design students, interior design. And we are obviously faced with it because they are really affected by AI. AI is, you know, it's an incredible tool. Um, so what I'm teaching them to do is, is yes, you have this creativity and you have the technical, the, the hands-on skills, the technical skills, but you need to be able to use AI as well because your competition is using AI. Um, so yeah, you look, you've got to face it. It's kind of like when the camera was invented, artists were faced with that same problem. You know, the camera could take photographs and, and do portraits that before only artists could do. So it's kind of that thing that's happening at the moment with AI as well, is, is that they are seeming really threatened, but you need to adapt, otherwise you're not going to survive. And those artists did that when the camera was invented, yeah. So yeah, I'm quite a, I'm a quite excited about it. I must admit, I've started using it in my own stuff as well, just to see what it can do. But I still think that you always need that human hand, regardless of how good the technology is. There's always somebody who has to make the decisions. I would really love to talk to you in a future episode about art because I believe that the the mana are suffering these days a bit of post-traumatic stress, you know, yes. and don't sleep yes. well, and perhaps in, in in doing art, they can perhaps express themselves. And I know some psychologists said to me once, if I can see what you dream, if I can see that monster, you know, somehow if you can tell me, I, I can perhaps help you. I don't know if it's true. We're not giving that. No, it's true. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely so, true. I found that's how I dealt with my own problems. You know, you come out of this so angry and you just want to murder everybody. And art help, you know, you take it definitely it's cathartic, it, it heals you. Um, so yeah, and it, it helps you express stuff that you can't put into words. Um, so yeah, I'd definitely be keen to speak about that with all the guys. You know. Is it true that the artist is somebody who has got a bit of a temper, you know, you have this beautiful female artist that she's dangerous to take? Is that true? It seems like I've met a lot of artists and they're all, they all have their demons and they, they, they got these angers and things ang you know, that they need to deal with. <laughs> yeah, so I, I definitely never, I've never met a calm artist, that's for true. They always have their demons. So. Man, they're special people. I, I know my wife is into this doodles or doodle. I don't even know the word in English. But they do these little, she does these little things and children's yeah. stories and things like that and it brings a great happiness but this brings me to the topic actually why you're here i understand yeah. you're doing a phd and you need some of the money all of you you guys guys start volunteering uh to, to come and assist you with what you're doing so can you tell us about this phd where it's registered what it's about and what do you need from from the money who's listening here now yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I'm I'm registered at Northwest University, uh Potchester. Um I'm doing a it's a degree, a PhD in 
visual arts, uh, art history, and performance art. Uh, so it's an interdisciplinary degree. Um, a lot of my post-grad stuff has been about the army and how you can utilize art to either heal yourself or express things that you have experienced. Uh, so I mentioned the, the artist, Jan van Amerva. He does that type of thing. A lot of my art has been about this exact same thing, my experiences of the army. So like I did a performance piece for UNISA when I was doing my master's, it was called Blostia. So it was about uh, the experiences as a, a new recruit in the army, you know, the bush phase and, and basics. And this idea that uh, your um, virility would be... Uh, hampered by using blowstein in your coffee and your thing, those type of things. So these myths or uh, semi-myths that get told about the army. So I deal a lot with that, that there are stories about the army and images and things that we get that get put out there, but they're very one-dimensional. So I try and show that it's, it's more complex than that. And my PhD is about that. It's about looking at the SADF as an institution, um, and its military culture, and then how did the men, the people that were actually serving, experience that? What were their experiences? What they were the effects of it? Um, and that's what I'm dealing with. So yes, I use the word gender quite often, and, and a lot of men don't enjoy that. I get that. There's this woke idea about using gender, but the idea is that the military was very masculine, and, they, and that, that affects the way that it treats men and the people in the in the, the military. So yeah, that's what I need. I need people that are willing to answer the questions that I've put through, put together in a questionnaire. It's chronological, so it takes you from when you were uh, giving the army your details as a 16-year-old in this at school. So in, when I got did that, we were called into a hall and the guys and the local commando were there and some of the teachers that were uh, that had been in the army wore their uniforms and you gave your details and you got registered to do your national service in two years time when you turned 18, when you finished school. So from there to being inducted, your your basics, uh, your all of that stuff, right through to when you complete your basics in your bush phase and you get deployed to your units, what were your experiences there? What was it like to clear out? What was, was your 40 days like? Uh, were you initiated? I know I, when I went up to... Uh, Amiga got initiated, we got initiated bad. You know, the Omana really messed us up um, just to welcome us. Um, so a lot of you would have that experience, but I found that some people didn't, you know. So I've been doing this for, this is my fourth year of doing this uh, PhD. Um, I've got, so I finally got ethical clearance because it's a very, very strict ethical clearance that's involved with academia. Um, we have to make sure that we do no harm and that the obviously that the, the university is protected, you're protected as a participant and I'm protected. So uh, that I just want to remind you then that we don't use your names. I know there are a lot of soldiers and, and conscripts and guys that serve that are willing to give them use their us let us use their names, um, but we don't. We protect you, we give you a password or code name. When I deal with your data and we, you know, we, your name is protected, uh, nothing um, that pertains to you directly will be in the report or my artwork that I make. Um, but you will receive a copy of that if you do, do participate. Um, so yeah, uh, that's basically what I've been doing. And then I've already got, uh, I've already had about ten participants, so I know more or less what it works and what doesn't. Um, so you will get a question. So I will give you an email address that you will contact me. And it's uh, info, info at sadfmilitaryculture.org.za. Um, you will contact me on that and say that you're keen to participate. Um, I will send you a, a document that explains the, the, the research and how you are protected, your information is protected. Um, you will sign a consent form. That will get sent back to me. Then I will send you a question, the questionnaire, the full questionnaire. Now, initially, we were going to do it as Zoom meetings, but it, it will take far too long for you to give me full answers on this questionnaire. So that we've realized that, that doesn't work. So what you'll do is you'll take that, that form and then fill out all the information, as much information as you can, 
and your email it back to me. I will process that information. If I need anything further, I'll contact you again. Um, but I will utilize that information and, and uh, put it into my thesis. The other part of my thesis is that I will take all that information and create some sort of artwork, some sort of performance work that deals with all that information that I've got. Um, so what uh, the reason I actually spoke about this is the, the thing that I found really interesting is that we have this idea, and you'll see, if you read the literature out there, most of it is about the border war, or it's about this idea that the SADF was this war machine, apartheid machine that held apartheid in place, protected the apartheid uh, government. It's far, far more complex than that. I guarantee you, if you, so you, if you do take part, I will send you the, the thesis that I've got. There's a lot of information in there that shows you just how complex the SADF was. For instance, I'll give you this really good example. Um, the SADF, long before we had the Springboks in 95, the SADF was using black soldiers, black people, black and white people were working together way before the Springboks in 95 worked together and showed that black and white people could work together. SADF was doing that way before that. And I was intimately involved with that with the Hearts and Minds program. So already that shows you the complexity um, that the SADF was the leading um, the change in the government long before it actually happened in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, blacks and whites were working together, living together, sharing experiences, um, friendships, way before um, it started happening in 95 with the Springboks. So that shows you the kind of the complexity that's involved with the SADS. Um, um, and that's my idea. So I will get your experiences and show the complexity of each person's experience is different from uh, everybody else's. And the units and, and uh, distinctions between the, the uh, Army and the Air Force and the Navy, each of those things was so complex and so different. The interrelationships between them, each unit was different based on who was in command. I can tell you that... Um, Commandant Adams was an amazing, intelligent man. Um, he he really uh, transformed that unit. It already had good foundations, but when Commandant Adams arrived there, that became a, a army showcase for the Hearts and Minds program. They they created the Adult Education Center. They uplifted everything. That they, they um, we had really really um, important people come and visit that because it was the army showcase for the Hearts and Minds. We had. All the uh, the, the uh, army generals arrived there. Magnus Milan. We had some. Uh, Wil Wilbur Smith came and visited. You know the writer. He was there. Uh, obviously the the um, the radio people, Tony Esme, and all those people came and visited. So we had we had a lot of VIPs passing through there. We had uh, some of the Chinese or not Chinese Korean people come through there to come and see our unit. We had Israelis come through and see how how to successfully uh, run a an Hearts and Minds campaign. So, yeah, okay, so that's it. I, I'm looking for people who are willing to share their experiences so we can show just how uh, multi-layered and how many variations of experiences of the Army there were. It wasn't just this, for this uniform, we either hate the Army or we love it. It's far more complex. You, it's kind of this love-hate relationship more than that. Um, and now the other thing that I just want to mention is, although the the, the um, project is not um, to do any psychological or emotional healing, you will find it very healing. Everybody who's taken part has, has said that they found it very cathartic, so healing, to express things that they haven't expressed. Yes, we talk about it when you're drinking at a bar or, or on our social media sites, but you don't really express those deep things with a sober, clear mind. Um, it's a lot of the time it's because you've had a couple of drinks or you're with mates and you express a couple of things, but you don't really do it in a complex and organized way, which is what I'm doing with this questionnaire. I think you will find it uh, quite um, healing uh, and you'll enjoy the process. I can guarantee you that. It does take some time. It does take some sacrifice from you, um, but I really... Uh, encourage you to take part it's 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 
it's a, a worthwhile program and the Northwest University think that it's worth doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have given me the clearance uh, or the bursary to do it. So I just want to be sure, you're only looking for male national servicemen, no one else. It, that should be no, called yeah, up just, if you don't arrive there for permanent force. No, no, just to you, the guys who did two years conscript. Um, I have to limit it because obviously if you have, you know, it's just too much. If I started including permanent force or females who are part of the army, it's got to be very specific. Um, obviously, if I have, if it's successful, which I, I think it will be, then I can actually uh, motivate to say, let's include what what was it like for the the permanent force? What was it like for the the, the woman in the SADF? Those type of things. But yeah, it's just for the moment, it's just the two year conscript guys because they experienced far more than the guys who did nine months or I need you know an extended period of time in the arm, but not permanent force. Yeah. Okay, and only in the army, not those called up to an air force or to the rest. No, no, they can. Yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, that's a good question. Yes, the guys who did air force and navy as well, please, and recce's, anything, but, yeah, any of the guys, yeah, please. Okay, no, that's quite clear, and I have to tell you, Andrew was kind enough to show me the questions. I, 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 <laughs> I have to apologize because my first reaction back was, man, this better not be well crap. <laughs> no, no, I get <laughs> that was, from was everybody. Very kind. <laughs> yeah. He was very kind and he was very patient with me and to deal with you people too. Guys, the, the questions are not about the size of, you know, what is in the showers. This is straightforward um, what what you experienced and, and it's worth your while. It's, you're not going to write uh, 100, 500 pages on it. it. It shouldn't take you that long to to complete and, and it's for a good cause. I mean, we need to understand what happened. I mean, a lot of people still wonder what, what on earth happened, what, what went on there because... At 18 years of age, man, you're not, um, yeah. uh, just just yesterday we had an episode, it's not out yet, it will be out. We, we spoke to our our pharmacist called uh, Kingston S. Patrick Cuthbert, the major. And he obviously speaks English deliciously. And he's a clever man. And I said to him, I said to major, tell me about drugs, the effect on your body and were these drugs used in the army? Because I know that uh, many NATO air forces use actually drugs to keep their pilots awake, and then they use drugs to keep them asleep when they should sleep. And so they are drugged while they're flying flying missions. And he started talking about that, and then he made a side comment, which is very interesting to me. He said, you know, during the Second World War, they were feeding people these amphet, amph, amph, something like that, which is the same as the, yeah, that's the thing, amphetamine. And so then they did some studies and they realized when you're at the age of 18, between 16 and 22 is the age where you can be mostly manipulated. And he made the comment that, guys, that is why they grabbed you at that age. It's because they could really change your views by during basics. And so it's important that we understand what happened to you, to us. I mean, it is really important. I pray that you will... Um, you will uh, support Andrew here. Yeah, we'll leave the details, everything there. If you can't get hold of him, get hold of me, and I'll refer you there. And from there on, it's in your hands. And uh, any last words, Andrew? Um, yeah, I just want to thank you again. First, it's it's been great that I could, because I've like I said, I've had a lot of pushback against. Uh, so when I put it on social media, everybody thought, "Nah, this is." People out to get us, and they they were very anti. I got a lot of bad. So the guys were, were weren't weren't uh, interested in putting on their sites anymore because everybody just attacked it. So it's great to come through to somebody who has a lot of pull in the 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 this uh, SADF conversation that is out there. It's grown, which is wonderful. Because when I first started this, there wasn't much conversation about the SADF. It was mostly around bras and things, but then I, I saw that uh, the ex-conscripts were starting to talk about it through social media sites. But the problem is there is that you have very specific types at, in each group. Um, and the army's not like that. It was far, far more complex than that. And men, the men were far more complex than either support of apartheid or uh, against apartheid. It wasn't just as simple at all. And yeah, so hopefully you'll 
give some insight into that with, with my research project. And you will see that, uh, again, as I mentioned, there are a lot of um, studies out there about the border war and all of that, but very few studies on what it was actually like to be in the military and what it was like to experience the SAD. Um, we do have soldiers. I mean, I, I think you've seen this. You must have seen the Sentinel project. There's this, yeah. Okay, so he does this. Uh, he's got a lot of uh, testimonials from the soldiers, but nobody actually analyzes. And and that's what my, my study has been. It's analyzing those conversations. Yeah, and of course, if you start talking on, uh, on other social media or even on legacy, I always caution and I say, guys, you can't reveal everything because you might really get into trouble. But with yeah. you guys, it's different because there's uh, confidentiality and it is a major university. Uh, you know, I was from a free state university, so we met on the rugby field and one. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, let me say that. But no, I'm just joking. But the point I'm making is, guys, this is for real. University is not going to risk its reputation just to get you. You're not that important. And then so you can open up, you can talk to these people, you're covered by law, uh, give it a try. If you feel you don't want to do it, please go and do it, because that means to me that that you're still hiding these things, you're keeping it inside you, it's not going to end well. Trust me, I've spoken to so many psychologists here, I've spoken to numerous crooks holders, and they all say to me, Chris, just the opportunity to speak, just the opportunity, because I know when we came back, nobody cared. They couldn't give a single whatever. There were secrecy clauses, which is not applicable anymore, by the way. And so come out, come and speak to Andrew. And as we always say to you here, yeah, until we meet again, God bless. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe and ring the bell to receive notifications.